Number 5. The Boys from Hannibal On May 9, 1967, 11-year-old Joel Hogue and his 13-year-old brother, William, came home covered in mud. The brothers were two of 11 children, and they lived in Mark Twain's hometown, Hannibal, Missouri. When their parents asked why they were so muddy, the boys explained that they were doing some cave exploring. Their parents scolded them, and the next day when they wanted to go out and play, they were told that they weren't allowed to leave the backyard. But sadly, boys will be boys, and the two Hogue brothers left the backyard. The brothers were last seen by firefighters heading towards a cave on the south side of Hannibal with shovels and a flashlight. When the family didn't find the boys in the backyard, they searched the neighborhood for them. They weren't found in the neighborhood, so they contacted the police, and a larger search was launched. Around the same time that the police started searching for the Hogue brothers, the parents of another boy in Hannibal realized that he was missing. 14-year-old Craig Dowell was an acquaintance of the Hogue brothers, and a few witnesses thought that they saw him with the Hogues as they walked towards the cave. There were two problems facing the searchers. The first was that the caves were a series of tunnels, and in the tunnels there were several deep pools of water and steep drop-offs. The second problem was that thanks to nearby construction, there was a cave-in in the area where the boys were last seen. The initial conclusion was that the boys got trapped in a tunnel after the cave-in. Expert cave searchers and skin divers from around the country came to Hannibal and helped search for the boys for 38 days, but no trace of them has ever been found. 39 years after the disappearance, a construction project caused a new entrance to open up on a tunnel, and on one of the walls someone had painted an arrow. The families were hoping that it was a tunnel that had not been searched. The tunnel was searched, but again, there was no trace of the three boys. Since absolutely no trace of the boys' bodies, or any of the equipment that they had with them on the day that they went missing, has ever been found, it has led to some speculation that the boys aren't in the tunnels at all, and they were kidnapped instead. But again, there is no physical evidence to back up that theory either, and the whereabouts of the boys remains a mystery. Number 4. Leslie, Julie, and Timothy Gunthry In early 1977, 29-year-old Leslie Gunthry and her husband, Tim Sr., were living apart. Tim Sr. was living in Katona, New York, and Leslie was living with her mother and the couple's two children in nearby White Plains. Although the couple was split up, they still had an amicable relationship. At 1.30 on the afternoon of February 5th, 1977, Leslie picked up her daughter Julie, who was six, and her son, Timothy, who was three, at their father's home and they drove off in Leslie's 1974 green Ford Maverick that had a white roof. And that was the last time any of their family ever saw them again. In over 40 years, not even their car has been found. At first, the police thought that the most logical explanation is that their car crashed into one of the lakes that are beside the highway that leads from Cantona to White Plains and their car is still submerged. But according to historical weather forecasts, 1977 was a cold winter in that part of New York and the ice on the lakes would have been thick enough for a car to drive on. The next theory was that Tim Sr. was responsible for their disappearance. After all, he was the last person to see them alive. The police quickly ruled him out as a suspect, and in the ensuing years he spent his life savings hiring private investigators and personally following up on tips and possible leads. The police thought that was possible that since their bodies and their car weren't found, that they are still alive and either chose or were forced to disappear. Just a year after they disappeared, a tabloid newspaper published a story about a hermit who lived in Utah near the Arizona border with several wives. There was a picture of the wives, and one of the women looked like Leslie, and in the caption it said that the woman's name was Leslie. The woman in the picture looked enough like Leslie that Tim Sr. and a detective flew out to Utah to check out the hermit and his wives. By the time that they got there, the hermit and his wives had left the area, and no one knew where they went. Over the past 40 years, there have been several sightings of Leslie, but none of them have ever been confirmed, and there have been no sightings of the children. If they are still alive, at the time of this video, Leslie would be 69, Julie would be 46, and Timothy Jr. would be 43. Number 3. Dalru Fallet 
On July 29, 1965, three men armed with guns stormed into a bank in Gothenburg, Sweden. They were dressed in women's clothes and they had blonde wigs on. One of the robbers watched the door while the other two walked into the bank, firing wildly into the ceiling, which sent many of the employees and customers scurrying for cover. One of the customers didn't flee, and instead, he tried to wrestle the gun away from one of the robbers, and the robber ended up shooting himself in the leg. After robbing the bank, they ran to a nearby river and discarded their disguises. Underneath the women's clothes, they were wearing wetsuits. The plan was to jump into the water and swim to a getaway boat, but they were all arrested before making it to the boat. Later that same night in Gothenburg, the family of 16-year-old Shell Johansson became worried when he didn't come home. Then, over the next several days, the families of 22-year-old Gay Carlson and 21-year-old Jan Yolof Daswu also noticed that they were missing. The three young men were acquaintances and worked together. Months later, the authorities realized that they were all together when they went missing. They were all seen in a midnight blue 1956 Volvo PV444 on the day of the robbery. The young men in the car have never been found. But the story only gets weirder from there. In July 1965, Hubner Lundquist was hitchhiking from Skane to Lucille, and when his parents didn't hear from him after a few weeks, they contacted the police. The last time that Lundquist's family heard from him was a postcard that was mailed from Gothenburg on July 29th, which is the same day that the three young men disappeared, and it was the same day as the robbery. This has led people to speculate that the four disappearances and the robbery are all connected. One theory is that the young men saw the robbers prepping for the heist, and the robbers killed them to keep them quiet. Another possibility is that the three young men were actually involved in the robbery and chose to disappear when it went wrong. Lundquist may have either been killed by the six of them, or he wasn't involved and his disappearance is a total coincidence. Or it is wholly possible that the disappearances of the three young men and Lundquist and the robbery aren't connected at all. Perhaps the three young men got into a car accident in a remote area or crashed into the water and their car just hasn't been found. Lundquist was hitchhiking, so it's even possible that he was in the car with them. It's also possible that Lundquist is still alive. There are two people who said that they saw Lundquist after he disappeared, but their claims have never been verified, and he has never returned home or contacted any friends or family. Sadly, the families of the four young men have been waiting over 50 years to find out what happened to them, but they are no closer to any answers. Number 2. The Jack Family The Jack family of Prince George, British Columbia were a young Aboriginal family that were struggling to make ends meet. On the night of August 1, 1989, the family's patriarch, 24-year-old Ronald Jack, was seen talking to a Caucasian man at a local pub. After talking for a little bit, Ronald left the pub with the man. Ronald then went home and told his wife, 26-year-old Doreen, that he had gotten them jobs at a logging camp out of town. They were apparently great jobs that included daycare, but in order to get the jobs, they had to leave that night. So they gathered up some of their belongings and got their two sons, 9-year-old Russell and 4-year-old Ryan, into the car, and then they drove off. At about 1.30 a.m., Ronald called his mother and told her about the jobs. Ronald told his mother some details about the jobs, but it didn't say where the camp was located. He also said that the family would be gone for 10 days to 2 weeks. Tragically, that was the last time anyone heard from the family. After the call, they disappeared and not even their car has been found. After the family was reported missing, the police went to their home in Prince George and it looked like the family planned to return after a short time. Next, they traced the call that Ronald made to his mother, and they learned that the call was placed about 30 miles away from Prince George, near Bedasti Lake. But in terms of clues, that was it, and the case quickly froze over. Nearly seven years later, on January 28, 1996, the Prince George Police Department received a call from an anonymous man. The voice was muffled, and it was hard to hear, but the man said that the family was buried at the south end of a ranch. After cleaning up the audio, they couldn't say for sure, but they thought that the caller said Gordy's Ranch. Based on the call, the police did end up searching a ranch, but there was no trace of the family. 
They also traced this call, and it came from a home about an hour away from Prince George. On the night that the call was made, there was a party happening at the house. The party guests were interviewed, but they all claimed that they didn't know who made the call. Where the Jack family went missing suggests that they may have been victims of foul play. They were heading west on British Columbia Highway 16 on a stretch of highway infamously known as the Highway of Tears. The Highway of Tears is a stretch of 450 miles of Highway 16 that runs between the cities of Prince George and Prince Rupert. Since 1969, nine confirmed women have gone missing or were murdered while hitchhiking on Highway 16. But Highway 16 isn't the only deadly highway in that area of British Columbia. On Highways 5 and 97, there are another nine confirmed missing or murdered women. However, many people think that the number of victims is actually much higher than that, quite possibly in the 40s, and that includes the Jacks. Many of the victims are Aboriginal women, and for years neither the Royal Canadian Mounted Police nor the Canadian government put a lot of effort into solving these cases. For example, Stephen Harper, who was Canada's Prime Minister from February 2006 to November 2015, continually rejected pleas for an inquest into the missing and murdered women. When Harper was asked about doing an inquest into the missing and murdered Aboriginal women in the run-up to the 2015 election, he said, Um, it, it isn't really high on our radar, to be honest. You know, our ministers will continue to dialogue, uh, with, uh, those who are concerned about this. Despite indifference from the government, in 2012, the RCMP announced that they had a suspect for some of the Highway of Tears murders, and he was quite possibly the person who was responsible for the disappearance of the Jacks. His name was Bobby Jack Fowler, and he was a transient who traveled extensively through the United States and Canada for over 40 years. In 2002, the RCMP announced that Fowler's DNA had been linked to one of the cold cases from 1974. 16-year-old Colleen McMillan was last seen hitchhiking on Highway 97 in August 1974 and her body was found a month later. Unfortunately, by the time the police learned that Fowler was McMillan's killer, he had been dead for six years. He died in prison in 2006 while serving the 10th year of a 16-year sentence for raping a woman he met in a bar. The question is, was Fowler the man who was seen talking to Ronald Jack on the night that he disappeared? That question may never be answered with certainty, because it's unclear where Fowler was in 1989, and the police are still trying to piece together his past. Fowler would move from town to town, sometimes staying no more than a day. He lived in rundown motels and made money by doing odd jobs. The police in Canada and the United States think it's possible that Fowler is responsible for over 20 murders. That being said, it's not possible that Fowler is responsible for all the Highway of Tears murders because at least three happened after 1996, which is when he was incarcerated for rape. Meaning there is at least one other killer who used the interior of British Columbia as their hunting grounds and they are still possibly free today. Number 1. Ann Miller, Patricia Bluff, and Renee Brule On the morning of July 2, 1966, 21-year-old Ann Miller picked up her two friends, 19-year-old Patricia Bluff and 19-year-old Renee Brule at their Chicago area homes. Brule and Bluff were friends from high school, and they met Miller because the women all boarded their horses at the same stable. They were heading to the beach at the Indiana Dunes, which is about an hour's drive from Chicago, and it's on the shores of Lake Michigan. The women arrived at the beach at about 10 a.m., and since it was a hot day and it was the Saturday of a long weekend, the beach was very busy. Many hours later, as the sun started to set, a young couple on the beach flagged down a park ranger. The couple told the ranger that they saw three young women go into the water at about noon, and while in the water, they talked to a man on a boat. Another set of witnesses described the man as well tanned in his early 20s with dark, wavy hair. The boat had three hulls, an outboard motor, and it was about 16 to 18 feet long, and it was white with a blue interior. The three women boarded the boat, but they didn't return, and their belongings were still lying on the beach. On the blanket were the women's purses, shoes, and clothes. The ranger gathered up the belongings and took it to the ranger's office where they were forgotten about because it was a busy long weekend. Two days later, the ranger's office got a call from Renee Brule's father, and he sounded panicked. 
The ranger checked the belongings and found a set of car keys that belonged to a car that was in the parking lot that had not moved since Saturday. The ranger called the Chicago police and found out that the car belonged to Ann Miller. He also learned that Miller and her two friends had been reported missing two days earlier. Searches were conducted on both land and the waters of Lake Michigan, but at this point the young women had been missing for 48 hours. During those 48 hours, thousands of people visited the beach, so finding any possible clue at the scene of their disappearance was impossible. At first, the police and the rangers thought that the boat that the women were on sank. Not far from where they were last seen, searchers found pieces of what they believed to be seats of a boat, some oil and gas cans, and an oil-soaked piece of wood. But it was hard to tell how long the debris from the boat had been in the water, and the Coast Guard had no records of a boat going missing that day. Also, two of the women were very strong swimmers, so the police don't think that they drowned. The next theory is that the women wanted to disappear. Out of the three women, only Renee Brule was married. In her purse that was found at the beach was a letter addressed to her husband of 15 months. Brule wrote that she was leaving him because he spent too much time working on his cars and hung out with his friends too much. The letter was dated two weeks before she disappeared, and it's unclear why she never gave it to her husband. The husband was interviewed, and he said that he had no idea that she was unhappy. Brule's family thinks that she may have written the letter in a fit of anger and then decided not to give it to her husband. She may have even forgotten that it was in her purse. The police concluded that all three women had personal problems, but nothing serious enough to fake their death over. If the three women didn't drown and didn't choose to disappear, they may have met with foul play. If they did meet with foul play, there are two very different sets of suspects. The first set of suspects is a pair of abortionists. Just before the three women disappeared, Miller told friends that she was three months pregnant. Patricia Bluff may have also been pregnant. At the time, abortion was illegal in Illinois, so it's possible that the women went to Indiana to meet a husband and wife team named Helen and Frank Largo, who performed black market abortions. On the day that the women went missing, the nephew of the Largos was at the same beach, and he matched the description of the man seen on the boat. The theory is that the nephew picked up the girls at the beach and then took them to a houseboat where the Largos performed the abortions. They think that something went wrong and all three women were killed to ensure that they would stay quiet and then their bodies were dumped in the river. This is only speculation and there is no evidence implicating the Largos in the murder of the three women. The second theory about who may have killed the three women is based on the stable where the women kept their horses. Four months before she disappeared, friends and family of Patricia Bluff noticed an injury on her face which could have been caused by a fist. When she was asked about the injury, she said that she was having some problems with some syndicate people. How this is linked to the stable is that the stable was owned by a man named George Jane. His maternal half-brother was a rival horse breeder and a stable owner named Silas Jane who went by Cy. Cy thought of himself as a businessman, but he was actually more of a psychotic gangster than a businessman. Specifically, he was the head of a criminal network called the Horse Syndicate. The criminal network consisted of riders, trainers, owners, and veterinarians who developed plans to kill horses to collect insurance money. Cy hated George because in 1961, one of George's horses beat one of his in a competition. After the loss, Cy swore that he would kill his half-brother. In June 1965, George asked a riding instructor named Cherry Rude to run an errand for him and to take his car. When Rude started the car, a car bomb exploded and she was killed instantly. The police knew that Cy planted the bomb, but they couldn't prove it. Since the bomb was planted at the stables where Miller, Brule, and Bluff boarded their horses, the theory is that one or all three women saw something that they shouldn't have and they were killed to silence them. Besides trying to kill his brother, Cy did have a reputation for violence and he has been linked to some of Chicago's most notorious crimes. Cy's criminal history dates back to when he was just 17 years old. He was convicted of rape and he was sent to a state reformatory for a year. The first major crime that he was connected to as an adult was the murder of 14-year-old Robert Peterson and two brothers, 13-year-old John and 11-year-old Anton Schusler. On October 16, 1955, the boys went to downtown Chicago to see a movie and they didn't return home. 
Their nude bodies were found two days later. They had been severely beaten and strangled. While the case wouldn't be solved until 1994, what happened was that the boys were hitchhiking and they were picked up by a horse trainer named Kenneth Hansen. Hansen took the three boys to Sy's stable where he was an employee. Once at the farm, he killed all three boys and then Sy apparently walked in on the murders. Sy was worried that the scandal would ruin his reputation, so he helped Hansen dump the bodies. Then, eight months later, the stable where the murders took place just happened to catch fire. It's believed that Sai ordered the fire to be started to destroy any evidence of the murders and for the insurance money. Then, over the next 10 years, Sai continued to threaten and harass his half-brother. He also hired several people to kill him. In 1966, one of the men who Sai asked to kill his half-brother went to the police, but when it came time to testify against him in court, the man said that he had amnesia. The man was sent to jail for 30 days for contempt, and Sai was acquitted. Obviously, George was nervous and feared for his own life, so he had a tracker placed on Sai's car. On January 19, 1969, George had 28-year-old Frank Michelle, who was the son of one of his employees, go to Sai's house and change the battery on the tracker. Hours later, Michelle would be dead. According to Sai, he was watching TV when someone rang the doorbell. He grabbed a gun and asked who was at the door. Sai said the man fired three shots into the door, so he fired back. Sai then went upstairs, grabbed two more guns, including an M1 rifle, and continued to fire at Michelle from the second floor as he was trying to flee. Sai then walked outside and found Michelle bleeding to death. From eight feet away, he fired his rifle twice, killing the already dying man. The shooting was ruled self-defense and Silas was never charged. On October 28, 1970, Sai finally managed to kill his half-brother George. As George was playing cards in his home with his family on his son's 16th birthday, a bullet fired by a hitman hired by Sai came through a window and he was fatally wounded. Sai was arrested and in 1973 he was only convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and not the murder itself. He was given a sentence of 6 to 20 years in prison and he served under 7 years. Sai was released from prison in 1979, and he died from leukemia on July 13, 1987. After Sai was dead, and there was no longer the fear of reprisals, witnesses started to come forward about crimes that Sai and the Syndicate were responsible for. One crime that tied all the Syndicate crimes together is one that they may not have committed. That is the case of 65-year-old candy heiress Helen Brock, who was last seen alive on February 17, 1977, leaving the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Jack Matlick, who worked as her chauffeur and houseman, claims that she was home for a few days and then he drove her to the airport so she could go to Florida. He didn't report her missing for two weeks, and during that time he had two rooms repainted in Brock's home and the carpet in one of the rooms was replaced. He took two polygraph tests about her whereabouts and he failed both of them. He also admitted that he got into a fight with her before she disappeared and that he stole money from her. What's interesting is that the investigation led to a second suspect, a gigolo and a horse seller named Richard Bailey. Bailey's business partner in the horse business was Sai's nephew, Frank Jane. Bailey had been dating Brock at the time of her disappearance and he was selling her horses at inflated prices. The police thought that Brock found out that Bailey was swindling her and she was going to tell the police. The police said that Bailey arranged to have her killed, quite possibly on the orders of Sai, who was in prison at the time. In 1995, Bailey pleaded guilty to 16 counts of racketeering and fraud, but he denied swindling Brock and he swore that he didn't have her killed. Amazingly, even though Bailey was in charge with Brock's murder, the judge thought that it was more probable that he committed the murder than not, so he sentenced Bailey to 30 years in prison. Bailey has been in prison ever since, and in 2017, he asked for a clemency hearing. Malik was never charged in connection with the disappearance of Brock, and he died in a nursing home in 2011. The investigation into Brock's disappearance uncovered more of the syndicate's crimes, which include killing horses in horrific ways for insurance money. It also led to Kenneth Hansen being charged in 1994 with the 1955 murders of Robert Peterson and John and Anton Schusler. During the 39 years that he spent free, it's suspected that Hansen abused hundreds of other boys and teenagers. 
He was convicted of all three murders in 1995, and he appealed the convictions. He went to trial again in 2000, and he was found guilty yet again. Hansen died in prison in 2007. Today, it is unclear if Silas Jane or anyone else involved with the Horse Syndicate is responsible for the disappearances of Ann Miller, Patricia Bluff, and Renee Brule, and the case is currently cold. Thanks for watching this week's video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We post a new video every Sunday. And thanks to everyone who already does subscribe. You guys are amazing. If you want to check out another mystery video about people who vanished into thin air, please click on one of the videos on the screen now. And thanks again for watching.